Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Eric Becker, uh, Digital Director and Senior Editor uh, at Words Without Borders, and I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's event, World in Verse, a celebration of the 2022 Poems in Translation collaboration between Words Without Borders and the Academy of American Poets. This is the fourth year we've collaborated in this fashion to expand the audience for international poetry in English translation. Um, we'll get started in just a few moments, but before we do, I wanted to walk you through uh, what you can expect and draw your attention to the various Zoom features that you can avail yourself of throughout the event. Uh, we will be recording this event and posting it to our YouTube channel and elsewhere uh, shortly. First, um, a note that we'll be muting everyone except for our participants to ensure that we can hear. Eric, you got muted. All right, um, let me start <laughs> start again then. Um, so I, I just I should mention in case I got muted for this that we will be recording the event. Um, we will also be muting everybody uh, except for our participants to ensure that we can hear uh, our readers this afternoon. And we'd ask that you keep yourself muted throughout uh, the duration of the event. Uh, the proceedings themselves will look something like this. I'll introduce the readers who will then share their work with you. And following these readings, uh, we'll then open things up to audience questions. Um, I'll also mention that this event is a multilingual affair. We'll have readings of each poem in both the original language and in English translation. Uh, for the English uh, language portions of the event, we will have closed captioning available. Uh, to turn that on, just click the arrow next to CC on your bottom toolbar and select Show Subtitles. Um, in the chat window at your right, I direct your attention uh, to an accessibility packet, which my excellent colleague Maggie uh, is sharing right now. Uh, and you'll notice on the top right of the Zoom application window that you have the option to toggle between gallery view and speaker view. Uh, we suggest uh, speaker view so that you can see our our readers. Um, I'll note that WWB is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization and our readers provide a crucial source of support for our mission of expanding cultural understanding through the finest contemporary international literature. We've been doing this work now for 19 years, publishing more than 2,700 works of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry by writers from more than 140 countries whose work has been translated from more than 130 languages. Uh, so while our rich archive at wordswithoutborders.org is free and available to all, we'd like to ask that if you like what you hear today, you consider giving what you can at wordswithoutborders.org slash donate. No amount is too large or too small. Uh, and you can follow the link in the chat window at right. Also, uh, I'd just like to say, you know, just because we're all on mute doesn't mean you can't offer your reactions to the readings you'll hear this afternoon. Uh, please use the chat window at right to offer your, your praise, your comments, your reactions, uh, and to ask any questions that you would like to have answered during our Q&A following the performances. I'd also like to mention that if, you like, uh, if you'd like to keep up with what, what we do, you can sign up for our free newsletter. That link also, I'm sure you know by now, is in the chat window at right. Uh, and finally, at the end of the event, you will be prompted uh, to take a short survey to help us learn more about our virtual event audience and to improve our events uh, as we do them in the future. So we thank you in advance uh, for your feedback. Okay, um, let's go. Um, so. Thank you for joining us uh, for this special event to celebrate international poetry. Uh, we have people joining us from many different cities around the world. So if you feel so moved, let us know in the chat window at right where you're tuning in from. Uh, for those of you who want to learn more about the poets and translators you'll learn, uh, you'll hear today, sorry, I direct you to the link in the chat window just now where you can find all of the poems read today presented in both English translation and in the original language and accompanied by audio recordings of the poets and translators themselves reading their work. These poems uh, have also been published in the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day newsletter, which reaches a half a million uh, subscribers worldwide, and which you can sign up for at poets.org slash poem a day. Uh, 
Uh, we're grateful and thrilled to have partnered yet again with the Academy uh, and for the Academy's com uh, commitment, continued commitment to poetry and translation. Um, that's enough for me, I think. So let's get started. Um, our first readers are Jeanette Clarionde and Samantha Schnee. And Jeanette um, will be reading um, from the original of uh, Who Are These Goddesses? Um, Jeanette, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Eric, and the Academy. Thank you, Samantha. Sobre quiénes eran estas diosas? Las llamaban así por ser portadoras de la máscara del dios y por tener un rostro propio y un corazón firme como la piedra. Soles, años caminaron con el jade bajo su lengua en pos de la casa. Labraron la tierra y adornaron sus cuerpos con joyeles de oro, no como símbolo de vanidad, sino por ser cuidadoras del amaranto en su anhelo de llama. Xutecutli era su dios, Xutlatoa su lengua, lo cual quiere decir palabra de fuego, esa que enciende el corazón. Ellas cuidaban de no usar la Xutlatoa, palabra de arena, que escurridiza huye sin dejarse aprender. Por las noches acompañaban en su descenso al sol. Ellas eran el jade y eran la transparencia, purificaban el inframundo y descifraban el sino. En el más allá moraba su fundamento, sus pétalos encantos se alzaban. Con humos y flores ornaban su casa y su deseo llenaban de visión. Fino cáliz de fulgor y semilla. Llevaban la mitad de su cuerpo sin cubrir. Eran brotes de omesóchil sus senos y su sueño verde yema de tepozán y de sus piernas florecían los blanquísimas plumas de Quetzal. Así fue que Coatlicue, diosa madre, dio a luz al sol y a la luna. Con su espada de fuego se decapitó a la luna, y por la escalinata su cuerpo rodó y se fragmentó en mil pedazos. Coyolxauqui yacía toda recubierta de radiantes cascabeles de sierpe. Al caer, entró en la oscuridad y por ello ha quedado grabado en el árbol del Amatl. Transitoria será la luz y su sombra. Dice así la historia de la mujer. Buscó rehacer su interioridad y para reescribir el libro. El canto renacerá en cada cuerpo de forma que aprendamos a resignificar el propio y así nuestros hijos y los hijas de nuestras hijas y las hijas de sus hijas sabrán que su cuerpo es luz en tierra, calor del sol con su tona, energía, fecundación, canto que dancen de alrededor de las estrellas. Es así que nos vigilan desde el firmamento. Cada mañana y cada noche, al nacer y al caer el sol, las diosas del agua tenían como propio ser dueñas de su deseo, guías de su luz, y así lo habremos de inscribir en nuestros corazones, lugar donde nacen las diosas. Gracias. That was beautiful, Jeanette. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, with us. We'll now have Samantha Schnee, uh, who uh, did the, the translation into English, um, reading from her translation. Take it away, Sam. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Jeanette, for trusting me with your beautiful words. And I want to thank the wonderful editors at World Poetry Books for this gorgeous edition that they did of this collection. Who Were These Goddesses? by Jeanette Clarion. They were so called because they wore God's mask and because their faces and hearts were resolute as stone. For days, years, they walked with jade beneath their tongues, seeking home. They worked the land and bejeweled their bodies, not as a sign of vanity, but because they tended the amaranth in their yearning for fire. Shutekutli was their god, 
Shutlatoa, their language, meaning words of fire, that which ignites the heart. They were careful not to use Shadlatoa, words of sand, fleeting, vague, and ununderstandable. At night, they accompanied the sun on his descent. They were jade, translucent, and purified the underworld, deciphering destiny. Their essence dwelt in the afterlife. Their petals arose in song. They adorned their home with hymns and flowers and filled their desire with vision, fine chalice of the sagacious seed. The upper half of their bodies naked, their breasts were buds of an omexochit, and their verdant dreams the sprigs of a birch. From their legs blossomed the pure white feathers of the Quetzal. Coatlicue, the goddess mother, gave birth to the sun and the moon. With a sword of fire, the sun beheaded the moon and tossed her body down the steps, shattering it in a thousand pieces. Koyoshauki covered head to toe in shining rattles of vipers. She fell and entered darkness, and so it was recorded on the tree of Amadu. Light and shadow will not last, so says the history of woman. She sought to recreate what was within her to rewrite the book. The song will be reborn in each body in such a way that we learn to redefine what is ours, as our daughters will, too, and our daughters' daughters, and their daughters' daughters will know that their bodies are light on earth, heat of the sun with its tona, energy, fecundity, song that dances along the perimeter of stars. And so they watch over us from the firmament at dusk and dawn as the sun is born and dies. These goddesses of water were destined to be masters of their own desire, guides of their own light. We must engrave upon our hearts the place where goddesses are born. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samantha. That was, that was absolutely spectacular. Um, we have next up, we're going to uh, hear from Zahid M. Nasser and Pauline Fan, uh, who will be reading uh, from uh, first in the original, uh, Kritekin. And you can find, I neglected to mention the first time around, uh, you can find in your chat window uh, as we go through these readings every time, you can find a link both to the bios um, for all of the contributors and also uh, the link to uh, the poem itself. And if you want to um, follow along with the original uh, text as well, you will see there's a tab at the top of a page that says original language, and you can toggle that on um, and follow along. Uh, so with that, uh, I think we'd like to, to um, turn it over to Zahid, who will read uh, Kretekin. Thank you, Zahid. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Eddie. So I will be reading Reta. Nerete, senang menyaksikan degup dada, degup urat hijau. Oleh kerana aku hangat berkahan bibir. Ruah nafasmu bercakap rahi, alir deras darah sebagai gairah di kamar. Makin lama, makin naik ke mataku, menagih hidup. Mulut kita haus mencari susu dan mata air. Dan pakaian tak malu ketawa. Lantas sekarang, tanpa menghiraukan keresahan hari, mata kau tutup, bahu kau bawa, leher kau serah. Dan rambut kecil menjadi permainan dan teka kata. Hidungku sebagai anjing dan jemariku menghurungmu. Senyum nafasmu takal bahuku sebagai roda yang seturun dan senaik desahmu. Kau helah akhirnya sekujur rohwi dengan sejumlah hayat sambil kelip matamu menginjak suka di antara jariku sudah siap kereta dicucuh tubuh. Sedang asapnya nyusup ke dalam luhur canda seriusmu menjadi kota. Telah ku jamah, ku takluk seluruhnya di hari yang seperti ini. Di hari yang kau pinta aku jajahi, hari yang seperti ini. Okay, thank you. 
That was amazing, Sahid. Thank you so much uh, for that reading in the in the Malay. Uh, and Pauline, uh, we'll now hear from Pauline Fan, who um, did the English translation. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Zahid. Zahid and Nasser, breathtaking. I like to watch your breath heave, the pulse of your green veins smoldering at the crack of my lips. So bring in breath, speaks passion. Blood rush like the swell of desire in a room, surging higher and higher to my eyes, craving life. Our mouths thirst for milk, and wellsprings. Our clothes laugh unashamed into death throes, oblivious to the day's disquiet. You close your eyes, compose your shoulders, offer your neck, and tiny hairs unfurl into games and crosswords. My nose is dog-like. My fingers swarm around you. Your smiling breath hoists my clavicle like a wheel that rises and falls with your side. At last you inhale a Holy Spirit with several lives, while your eyes wink in pleasure. I finger the credit lit by her body, as smoke beeps to your sublime realm of solemn jest that becomes a city. I have touched it. I seize it all on a day like this, on a day you urge me to conquer, a day Thank you. Thank you so much, Pauline. Um, that was that was absolutely terrific. Um, so as we move on, I, I even feel funny sort of transitioning from the poetry to to the ins institutional message here. But we have. I just do want to remind everybody uh, who joined after the fact that we do have an accessibility packet uh, where you can follow along, read along with the poems uh, uh, if you would like. Uh, we also you can also avail. Uh, yourselves of the closed captions as well, uh, which we'll have for the English language uh, portions. And now we're going to move on um, to Kareem James Abouzid, uh, who will be reading both the original Arabic and then his translation um, of the poem Near the Shrine of St. Nam uh, by the Palestinian poet Najwan Darwish. Kareem. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. Um, yeah, Najwan unfortunately couldn't be here today, so I will be reading the Arabic in his stead. And we'll start with the Arabic and then go to the English. Qurba Marqad al Qaddis Naum bi Maqadonia. Waqaftu fil Kanisat al Hamra, bi Qibabiha al Sagirati, mithla Bara'ima Mutafatihatin fil Hajar. وقفت قرب مركد القديس السائحة تضع خدها على بلاطة الضريح لتسمع نبض قلبه لست سائحا مثلها القديس غادر معي الحجرة والكنيسة التي كتبها البناؤون في ذكراه كانت حلما صغيرا في ركضتي عبثا يصل السائحون Near the Shrine of St. Naum by Najwan Darwish. I stood in the red church, its tiny domes like buds blossoming in stone. I stood near the saint's resting place while a tourist laid her cheek on the tombstone to hear his beating heart. But I was no tourist, and the saint left the room with me, and the church the builders wrote in his memory was nothing more than a passing dream in his eternal sleep. The tourists come in vain, as do the believers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kareem. Uh, that was absolutely terrific and great to um, have you be able to read the Arabic um, in Najwan's stead. Uh, we're going to close out uh, our event here, um, or, or at least the reading portion. Uh, a reminder, uh, if you do have questions uh, for our readers, you, you can start getting them in now in the chat. 
um, we will follow uh, this final readings here um, with a Q and A um, with our guests. So, um, you know, if if you want to know about their work, whatever you want to know, just pop it here um, in the chat, and we'll do our best to get to to all of them. Uh, so, uh, closing things out, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Samicha Negrush, uh, who will be reading uh, her poem, Anna. Thank you, Eric, and thank you to Words Without Borders for all your wor the work you do to make our work visible. I am sorry Mar Marilyn is not with us today. I think Eric is reading the translation. So first, the French. Anna, la chaise est renversée. C'est à partir de la fin, n'importe quelle fin, qu'il faudrait réajuster l'oubli. Le paradis, Anna, a parfois un goût de soleil moisi. Quand je pense au soleil, je veux penser à Sena, à Amrouch, à Amrani. Mais quand je pense au soleil, je veux penser au soleil de la Californie, celui que je n'ai jamais vu, cette terre mère qui t'irrigue. Le désir prend place dans ce qui adviendra peut-être, peu importe si ça advient. À la fin, le paradis rétablit la chaise. Je ne dis pas que la chaise redevient droite, je ne dis pas qu'elle se dresse, mais quelque chose, n'est-ce pas, doit être rétabli, et je crois que c'est l'idée même du paradis qui m'inquiète. Dans le Coran, il ruisselle sous les pieds des mamans. Dans le Coran, certains retiennent les vierges offertes aux sacrifiés. Il faut renverser le sacrifice, Anna, sans doute rétablir les vierges et les mères. Pour le marabout de Dakar, il ne sert à rien d'aller à la Mecque, car, dit-il, la Mecque, c'est le flanc de ta mère. Au nord, le flanc de ta mère, dit-il, il ne dit pas « étrangle-toi avec ton cordon ombilical », mais ta mère, comme une Mecque, est une terre promise, il ne faut y voyager qu'une fois. La terre de ma mère est un cordon joyeux, c'est une chanson dans le bain, Thawardet. Thawardet, la rose, ma mère se rappelle le bain, tous les enfants sont beaux et le paradis Anna est une mer dans laquelle on ne voyage qu'une fois, un refrain qui reste comme un battement lointain, nous ne sommes pas parfaits Anna, nous ne sommes pas imparfaits non plus. That was spectacular, Samira. Thank you so so much. And we were able. It was great to have you um, to get a reading that that is frankly an experience that we um, we don't uh, we don't have just on the page as well. So thank you uh, for your singing. I won't I won't unfortunately try to to replicate mm -hmm. that, uh, but I will do my best to to do justice here to um, Marilyn's translation as well. Um, and of course. Um, we wish her sort of uh, we wish her the best um and and are sorry that um she couldn't be here uh okay so anna anna the chair was overturned it's after the end whatever end that we must readjust forgetting paradise anna sometimes has a taste of moldy sun when i think of the sun i want to think of senak of amrush of amrani but when I think sun, I want to think of the California sun, the one I've never seen, that mother earth that nourishes you. And desire makes its place in what perhaps will happen. It doesn't matter much if it happens. At the end, paradise puts the chair back. I'm not saying the chair stands upright again. I'm not saying that it gets up. But isn't there something that has to be put right? And I think that it's the idea of paradise itself that's bothering me. In the Quran, some remember especially the virgins offered to martyrs. There should be an end to such sacrifice, Anna. Of course, restore the virgins and the mothers. For the marabout of Dakar, there was no point in going to Mecca because, he said, Mecca is your mother's hip. 
honor your mother's hip, he said. He didn't say, strangle yourself with your umbilical cord. But your mother, like Mecca, is a promised land. You must go there only once. My mother's land is a joyful cord. It's a song in the bath, the wardits, the rose. My mother remembers the bath. All children are beautiful. And paradise, Anna, is a mother in whom you travel only once, a refrain that remains like a faraway pulse. We aren't perfect, Anna. We aren't imperfect either. And just we thank Marilyn for those for those terrific words. Uh, and and of course you can read, you can uh, listen to an audio recording of Marilyn reading it herself um, on on wordswithoutborders.org uh, at the link um, at right. So uh, please do that. Um, as we will transition here, I think, um, to your questions in just a second. So we'll sort of um, open that up. Um, you know, so uh, if you haven't, if you have a question and you haven't gotten it in yet, um, put them here at right, and we'll get to as many of these uh, as we can. Um, and maybe while we're waiting uh, uh, to get started here, I'll actually uh, lead one off maybe for for uh, Jeanette here, which is, um, you know, uh, Samantha alluded to the fact that uh, the poem um, that, that she and Jeanette read is actually a fragment from a longer work uh, that came out from World Poetry Books. Uh, Jeanette, I wonder if you could just tell us uh, sort of about the, the origin of the poem a little bit. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I need to un, unmute you. Uh, just a second, if someone can do that, actually. Um, or I can do it. Just one moment, Jeanette, sorry about that. Uh, there we go. Uh, can you can you unmute? I'm a, there we go. Yeah, it's still not. Just a second. I'll ask one more time. You should see a you should see a button um, pop up on your screen. I say as if my my fingers would be. Uh, Isabella, do you have a way to to? I'm trying, but it only allows me to ask her to unmute. Yeah. Are you getting a a message, Jeanette? You know what we you know what we might do. I I hate to ask you to the, to do this, Jeanette. Maybe we'll we'll come back to this question. I suspect if you if you rejoin us, um, it won't mute you automatically. And Isabella, if you can just not automatically when when she signs off and signs back in, if you can just yeah, not because um, for whatever reason the the unmute button doesn't seem doesn't seem to be working. There we go. Now you're now you oh for a second you were good. Um, are you able to unmute yourself? Um, the thing is that I cannot. You're yes. good. You're good. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I um, I kind of lost myself here in the in the computer. I you cannot want me to myself. ask again? Yeah, I suspect it would be helpful, right, to ask you the the question again, which was just about the origin of of the poem. There's such strong imagery there. I, I'm sure we'd love to hear. It. Well, yes. Um, in uh, in 2021. Um, we were commemorating, um, as they call the encounter, the spiritual encounter of two worlds, Spanish and uh, and uh, Mexican, and and so there's a goddess who's called Coyolxauqui, and she was found in 1987 at Templo Mayor, at the ruins of Templo Mayor. It's a very big, it's a very big sculpture. Uh, which was was found, um, and uh, it's an oval piece that measures more than well. I'm going to say in, in meters, um, two and a half meters uh, of length, and it's oval, and it has the pieces of a goddess. 
So we have a very interesting archaeologist. Her name was Loret Seyudne, and her interpretation of the, of the falling of the goddess is that our, our task here on earth is to descend. Every day is to descend, to disintegrate matter so that we can be reborn in light. So what I wanted to do is go back to myths. Myths are very important in, very, in every culture. Uh, myths are the sustaining pillars of every culture in the world. If we could understand the meaning of myth and stop looking at them at stories without any philosophies or without any meaning, we can understand each other better. So Coyolchauki's body was found in pieces just as we find the bodies of dead women every day, 11 every day. So I wanted to make uh, an analogy, establish an analogy with the goddess of the moon and the bodies of the dead women in Mexico who when found, they are found fragmented and thrown into a plastic bag or else they are just thrown in part. It, it sounds horrible, but I need to mention because horror has to be mentioned and, and spoken and poeticized so that we can sublimize the pain of the parents of every woman that day dies every day in our country. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, we've got uh, another question here from, from Emma Jarrett um, in the similar, along the lines um, of that asked of Jeanette, which is, um, Emma says, I would be interested to hear the inspiration uh, for Samira's poem. You, you just asked me, uh, Eric. Uh... Yes. So, so uh, Emma asks about the origin of 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 your poem. Okay, uh, the origin is quite uh, multiple. It started as a discussion with the poet translator Anna Moskovakis. Uh, I was invited uh, to work with her in 2015. It was partly Pratt Institute. Institute and uh, the cat skills where I visited her. Um, and because Anna was occupied with uh, Thanksgiving, you know how long it, it can take to uh, prepare Thanksgiving. I was sitting in a room and trying to answer questions Anna asked me long ago while translating some, wor some work. Um, and I was interested by two issues. One of them was all the difficulties we have between French and English uh, with words that look to be the same, uh, but not have the same weight, like popular, for example, which means absolutely something different uh, when you say pop populaire or populaire in French. And also more, more importantly, all the things we, we, we don't, all the questions we don't usually ask because it, it isn't correct to ask those questions uh, about family identity, intimacy. Uh, but of course, the translators need to deal with them. So I, I started with this image of paradise because Anna used it in a, in a book referring to uh, Kierkegaard. And then also because at some point she said, yeah, everyone thinks America is a paradise or California is a paradise. And I was stuck with this image because in Quran, in Islam, there is the image of the paradise which lays uh, under the feet of, uh, of mothers. And from there, I imagined all the, the, the idea of motherhood in our culture, the idea of sacrifice, but, uh, 
also that in our in my country that many people see as the country where terrorism started, Islamist uh, radicalism started. I remember this uh, this book from uh, uh, Claudia Rankin, Citizen. There is a page where she refers to Zinedine Zidane, but also to the Algerian as the terrorist. Uh, so for a terrorist who is going to kill himself, I mean, an extremist, uh, he's waiting for, the, for this ideal uh, image of the paradise. And uh, because when they do what they have to do, like put a bomb somewhere or uh, whatever, they are expecting to find this paradise that lays under the mother's feet. So when uh, Marilyn asked me for something that wasn't yet translated and published, I immediately thought, uh, thought of this text because I thought, okay, it was something that was created from the idea of a dialogue. How can we really discuss with each other? Should we not accept the, 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 this gap that absolutely exists between us because there will be misunderstandings mm -hmm. Uh, there will be uh, a distance, but I, I think our work collectively as artists, authors, translators, translators is to make this distance uh, shorter and shorter. So that's why I, I chose this, uh, this, this poem. And so, uh, Samira, following up on this, um, we have another uh, audience member, uh, Madeline, uh, who asks, um, well, she asked in the English translation what what part of the poem was sung. Uh, it's the I think it's Tawardits, right? Is the Tawardits uh, means in Berber uh, the rose uh, because Berber is one of my languages. I usually not use uh, for any languages inside my French, but there I I felt it had its place because I was referring to a mother, so thinking of my mother. I thought about this song that she was singing to me in the bath when I was around three or four years old. So I thought it was interesting uh, during the reading to give some uh, small part of this uh, of this song, which is in Berber in uh, Tamazight. No, it was it was amazing to to hear that because that's something that um, you know that 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 we just don't have access to. Um, at all so so thank you so much um we have another uh question this one is is going to be for kareem uh and this is a question from bella who asks uh in near the shrine of saint naum uh a beautiful poem in translation she says um i'm curious about the line and the church the builders wrote in his memory is it comparing writing to the building of monuments Compare or comparing the building of the church to words being put on a gravestone. I'd like to know more about this image. Um, yeah, so I uh, am always a bit hesitant to speak for Najwan, particularly because uh, Najwan generally doesn't like to speak about his poems, but uh, Perhaps it's good that I'm here instead of him. I might actually be able to give <laughs> a fuller answer, even if it's a uh, conjecture. Um, so that line is a pretty literal translation. Uh, that is the Arabic. And it, so it's sort of just as strange in English, uh, the church the builders wrote in his memory, as it is in, um, in Arabic. And what I would, my sort of conjecture here, um, first of all, you know, I asked Najwan, as I often do, where did this poem come from? And he, he uh, didn't say very much, but I know he went to the church. Uh, almost all of his poems that are sort of specific like this came out of, of real experiences. Um, and he has many poems that are evoking a certain moment in time. Um, so when I was translating, I, did, I didn't know much really. I didn't know anything about St. Naum. Uh, the church is beautiful. You can Google it and stuff. And so I did read a little bit of about St. Naum, and he was actually, uh, first I should say Najwan's not very religious, so uh, he's not religious at all. Um, it was interesting to have a poem centered on a saint. 
And one of the things I learned kind of in my brief moments of research was that he was uh, a founder of the very first literary school from the of the first Bulgarian empire, which was an empire that was around, I believe, from about the seventh to the 11th centuries. Uh, it was in the Balkan region, roughly what is now Bulgaria, but I believe quite a lot bigger. And many wars were fought between the Bulgarian empire and the, uh, the Byzantine empire uh, over that period of time. So what was interesting was that this saint was very associated with writing. And uh, I have a feeling, so first through those two literary schools, and then also he was a disciple of two other saints who were associated with the first, uh, I believe it was the first written Slavic language, Glagolitic, which uh, I think is, is long gone, um, and also uh, the Cyrillic alphabet. Glagolitic, sorry, was a script, not a language, a script. So there's a lot of stuff about writing in uh, St. Naum's uh, biography, and uh, Najwan is very much a student of history. So I have a feeling that uh, if he was here, he'd be able to give us uh, far more details on this, uh, on, on the actual figure. I did a fairly cursory um, amount of research. Uh, and I, if I had more time, I would have done more. But my guess is that's what is being referenced here. Great. Thanks for that, Kareem. That's a great question. Yeah, it, it was a terrific question. Um, speaking of other questions, well, so I have one as we rate, keep, um, keep them coming um, as well. We have a little time uh, left uh, while we wait for, for, for more of them. Um, I actually uh, have one for Zahid, uh, which is, uh, Zahid, you're, uh, you know, a, a translator as well. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us, um, uh, you know, a little bit about, about how that work, um, uh, how that, how that's been important um, to you, to sort of your own work, your own poetry, um, your work as a translator. So uh, thank you, Eric. Uh... Uh, I, 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 uh, for uh, initially the, 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 the poem itself is uh, not in my book, it, it is, it was published, uh, in one, uh, one internet portal. And I would say, uh, Pauline, uh, interested, uh, to translate it, which I I just uh, wrote it for maybe uh, because of the editor of the portal because he said he would like to publish one of my poems just and I I said I have one or two and I I gave it uh, to the editor editor and uh, somehow after it was. 2016, but uh, now it was uh, read again, and Pauline happened to be listened to the poem, and uh, he she said he wants to translate it, and uh, I think why not? And uh, uh, then he tra she translated it and. Uh, I think it, it was good and uh, it is nice to uh, to be translated uh, and the Dengarete itself it is only uh, a moment uh, with my wife and I just describe it with words and I think it is it's quite a straightforward uh, poem uh, and I don't know uh, but Pauline said that it was an erratic poems, but I said it wasn't. <laughs> uh, so that's how uh, the poem translates. It was uh, maybe five to six years ago uh, published, but it just happened uh, to be read again uh, this year. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's about, maybe the, the isolation we have uh, throughout two years uh, of the pandemic. I think it's quite uh, 
maybe in the intimacy of two people or the isolation of, of uh, uh, we as individual and our family and uh, it sort of, we, we try to uh, emulate these things. I, that what uh, I thought. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Zahid. And, and Pauline, a, a question for you, um, which of course, um, you know, you, you, you have your work as, your trans, um, as a translator. Uh, you're also the creative director of the Georgetown Literary Festival. And I wonder, uh, which is coming up in a, in a couple of weeks, in fact, and, and we'll have, um, in fact, some work from, from the festival, from the festival participants onwards without borders. Um, but I, I, I wanted to, to ask, um, you know, a little bit about the relationship between those two parts of your work and sort of, you know, um, as a festival director and as a translator. I think they are very much interrelated. And I think um, because I was a literary translator before I got involved in the festival. And so I, I think um, whatever I bring, my perspective and, and my direction in curating the festival always takes a lot of account. Um, I, I include a lot of literary translation and conversations and literary translators in the festival lineup itself, um, but not only panels or discussions that are, that are completely about translation, but I think one of the things I've tried to do is to expand even the linguistic breadth of the festival. And so even within Malaysian languages, because Malaysia is such a multicultural um, society, and it's sometimes even for Malaysian, we sometimes feel that we don't know each other. We definitely don't know each other's literature that well because the kinds of, uh, the kinds of complexities that we have, the languages that all exist together in Malaysia are as vast and, and distinct as um, English is very much part because we were, of course, um, a British colonial country. We also, Malay is the national language and the mother tongue of many, um, but we also have Chinese, which of course is also a very important distinct uh, language and not just one Chinese, but many different dialects of Chinese. Um, Tamil is another important language and not just Tamil, but also other dialects of, uh, or languages, Indian languages, indigenous languages. We have many, many layers of such things and, and all of those languages have their own literatures be it written or oral. And so that's something I've tried to do as a, as a festival director, for sure, is to bring some of those things together. Well, and, and so, I mean, that, that's that's fascinating to hear. And, and, and I wonder, you know, to, to hear you describe it, maybe, you know, it's a, you mentioned that sort of all these, these many languages have their own vibrant literary um, sort of tradition scenes. Um, you know, uh, to what extent is there um, I guess, uh, exchange between them? Or, or is, it, yeah. is it a situation where they are sort of distinct traditions that don't necessarily dialogue? Um, the interesting thing is they used to dialogue a little bit more in the 70s, I think. The 70s was kind of a point where there was a lot of um, sort of publishing, especially in the Malay literature. And I think at that point, people were trying to translate from other languages, but then things got a bit, little bit institutionalized. And since then, the cultural politics and everything has kind of uh, crept in and it, it stopped and we stopped talking to each other um, in the same way. But I think now in the past 15 years, I think there's more of independent efforts um, among all the literatures. And I, I hope that George Sandler says is one of those places people can actually speak to each other. So if, I would just like to say something also about Zahid's poem, he did mention why I was actually attracted to Zahid's poem. And it has something to do with the kind of poems that are being written in Malay at the moment. And so because there's been such a kind of push of um, national identity and national language, what's happened to the Malay language, I feel, is that a lot of it has become very institutionalized. And it is one of the most, I mean, to me, of course, but I think it's a naturally sensuous language and it's a naturally very lyrical language. Um, and the Malay culture and the Malay people, I think by nature are very sensual people. But what I think the institutionalization of language has done in some ways, and it's partly because of the kind of um, religious identity or the kind, the narrow religious identity that some parts of the population are trying to push, is that the Malay language is getting a little bit delinked from its sensuous roots. 
And I think Zahid's poem um, is radical in the sense that it's really unafraid. And he, I think Zahid wasn't thinking about doing that. It wasn't a mission for him to, to write an erotic poem, but he did. And I think for me, it was so wonderful to read the Malay language in that way, because it's naturally erotic and it's naturally lyrical and sensuous. And so I love that poem because it, it's, um, it does all the beautiful things for me that the Malay language is capable that's 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 amazing um sam samantha i also i also want to um get a question in here uh for you as well um because of course uh you've translated uh this book this poem and, and this book uh by jeanette but you're also the translator um uh you also translate prose for example uh carmen buyosa being one of your um your writers uh i wondered if if you could tell us a little bit about um, I guess the relationship between, you know, as a translator, um, you know, the relationship between your prose work and your poetry work, how, you know, how you see those being linked or not, um, and how they sort of inform, I guess what I'm asking is how they sort of inform one another. I think or it's probably different for every translator. For me, there's a tremendous freedom in translating poetry because the language is so compressed that um, you really have more freedom. That that might sound strange, but um, because you have the strictures of the rhyme, if there's rhyme and the meter and the the form of the poem and and Jeanette's poems are um, they have very specific shapes forms, um, but I find that you know, perhaps like um, I think of the Olipo and how members of the Olipo would put these abstract constraints on their own writing and that that was kind of conversely kind of freeing for them, that, that they stopped worrying so much about plot and started worrying about what word doesn't have the letter E in it or something like that, right? So, um, you know, for me, moving from prose, which is it's pretty specific to poetry um there is a beautiful freedom in that and you know I think that makes it more important for me as a translator to be able to work with the author and and Jeanette and I worked very closely together on revising the translation she had revised the text during the process of when while I was translating it so then when we went back to look at it together. There were some differences between how she had modified the original text and what I had translated. And in some cases, we just left it um, the way it was. So it's not, even though the, the book is, is published on FOSS, you know, with the Spanish and the English facing each other. Um, and here you can see, these are the Aztec numerals from numbers one to 52 that go with all of the tercets that follow the section we read today. Um, you know, I think it's it's a beautiful relationship to work with an author and and to be able to bring their words into English so that more people can read their thoughts. And that's really, I think, why we all do what we do. Yeah. Well, thank you um, for your work here with Jeanette's poetry. And and I mean, uh, you sort of gave us a uh, an example there by showing us the um the collection uh if people go to the to the poem page as well on the on the site they'll see that that particular section of the poem is something of an inverted pyramid um and you can see that so when when sam's talking about sort of form and shape um physical form being uh important to um Jeanette's work as well there we go um you know you can you can see that as well i i see one uh more uh question here it's actually from uh samira to pauline uh which is uh the question is would you say that the multiplicity of languages creates any conflict uh in malaysian society or is that sort of lived uh, in a peaceful experience in a peaceful way i think malaysia actually organically is uh, is peaceful um Politicians sometimes try to stir conflict, but I don't think we're naturally, we don't, we don't have natural tensions with each other. I mean, we have those, those ordinary um, tensions, but I don't think they come to the point of conflict easily unless they're really stoked by politics. Um, fortunately, 
we haven't come to that point. Um, there was, in 1969, we, we did have racial riots. Um, it wasn't quite as, as massive as uh, in some of our neighboring countries, um, but it was still, it has still left a deep mark on our society. But since then, we haven't had um, kind of bloody conflict. There's been definitely um, undercurrents of tensions, but I think if politics leaves us alone, we live actually very peacefully. And, and a lot of the, uh, including the multiplicity of languages, many, many people learn each other's languages. And that happens naturally. It's not, doesn't happen as much in schools, but people do learn each other's languages. It's terrific. And I, and I think that's um, a great place uh, to stop here. Um, we've sort of reached the end of our, of our questions. Um, I wanna thank everyone who came. Um, uh, thank you for, for listening and for celebrating uh, these poets uh, and translators uh, alongside with us. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you to, to all of our readers, of course, um, for your work uh, and also for sort of illuminating it um, uh, in this way.